Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Castor webinar with Dr. Andrew Brower, Estimating Transition Rates Between Types of Tobacco Product Use, Multi-State Transition Models for Longitudinal Data. Uh, before we introduce our speaker today, uh, I will go through a certain housekeeping um, uh, items for the webinar. That, uh, that you have in front of you. Uh, the presentation will be about 35 to 40 minutes with 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers for a total of 50 minutes. The participants will be muted upon entry and may only be unmuted with host permission. Questions can be submitted at any time via, via the Q&A feature or use the raise hand function if you would like to be unmuted. After the webinar ends, you will be redirected for a brief five question survey. And now, uh, on behalf of the Center for the Assessment of Tobacco Regulation, CASTER, at the University of Michigan and Georgetown University Career Enhancement Corps, I am delighted to introduce today's webinar speaker, Dr. Andrew Brower. Uh, Dr. Brower is a mathematical epidemiologist and modeler. He is currently an assistant research scientist in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Michigan. He received his BA in mathematics and chemistry and MA in mathematics from the Sony College at Potsdam in 2009 and his MS in Environmental Science and Engineering from Clarkson, Clarkson University in 2011. Dr. Brower also earned his MA in Statistics in 2015 and PhD in Applied and Interdisciplinary Mathematics in 2015 at the University of Michigan. He did his postdoctoral research in Epidemiology at the University of Michigan as well. Dr. Brower specializes in mathematical and statistical technique for a variety of application areas, including infectious disease, cancer, and tobacco control. Today's webinar presentation, as we said, entitled Estimating Transition Rates between types of tobacco product use, multi-state transition model for longitudinal data. Um, will um, in, in the presentation, Dr. Brower will provide an overview of multi-state transition modeling, which is a technique for analyzing longitudinal data that is increasingly being used in the tobacco control field to estimate multiple transition rates. For example, the smoking initiation, cessation, and switching between products and combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And now, with, uh, without further ado, I leave you with uh, Dr. Andu, Andrew Brower. Thank you, David, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming today. Um, it's a privilege to uh, be here um, uh, with the Castor Center. Um, so as David said, um, I will be introducing multi-state transition models um, to estimate transition rates between types of tobacco use. It's a technique that I found very helpful, um, both as a framework for thinking about uh, longitudinal data and also actually analyzing data. So um, today I'm gonna to be start talking through what multi-state transition models are and how they're helpful for analyzing longitudinal data. Um, then I'll go through with some specificity in how I actually develop, specify, implement, and interpret a multi-state uh, transition model. Um, hopefully that will be helpful for those of you who are considering implementing them yourselves. Um, and finally, I'll be going through um, the, an application of a multi-state transition model to the population assessment of tobacco and health study um, that uh, we published in 2020 um, to give more of a sense of sort of concretely what, what this uh, technique can do for us. So to start out with, what are multi-state transition models and why might you be interested in using them? So um, 
I think that many questions about tobacco use behavior um, are really questions about transitions between types of behavior and types of use. Um, so for example, initiation um, is an important transition from never use to current use. Um, and so we can we want to ask questions like what groups have the highest tobacco product initiation rates, and that might be for cigarettes, it might be for um, ends. Here I'll use ends to mean electronic nicotine delivery systems to include e-cigarettes, but also other e-products. Um, is ends use uh, associated with a greater likelihood or greater rate of cigarette initiation? And you can imagine all sorts of questions in the initiation um, world. Similarly for cessation, we can ask how durable short-term discontinuation of tobacco use is. Um, does it lead to longer-term quitting? Uh, to what extent is short-term discontinuation? Um, uh, how often is it associated with relapse? Um, we can start getting into other questions. Does menthol flavoring in cigarettes or any flavoring in ends um, associated with reduction in cessation? Um, we're also interested in product switching. What are the characteristics and behaviors that are associated when someone successfully switches from cigarettes to ends and sort of has that um, harm reduction profile? Um, and so this is just sort of a smattering of questions and there are many, many, many more that we could be interested in. Um, the second uh, point I wanna make is that uh, longitudinal data is extremely powerful, but can be very challenging to uh, analyze. Um, so when I say longitudinal data, I'm imagining that we're following a single individual um, or multiple individuals in their um, trajectories of tobacco use. So here's just um, a very hypothetical situation where we have a number of participants and in different follow-ups or different waves, we see what tobacco use state they are in based on some questions that we ask them. And so um, maybe people drop out after a certain number of waves, maybe they like go away, but then are, we're not able to contact them, but then they, they uh, reconnect later on. Um, and it can be kind of challenging and, and overwhelming to sort of, to be sort of faced with this gestalt of this longitudinal data. So what do we actually, what do we actually do with this longitudinal data? Um, and so, Conceptually, the sort of the, the concepts underlying the multi-state transition model approach is to sort of acknowledge that people have true underlying patterns of behavior, so that they do switch from um, different tobacco use states. Here in this example, I'm considering never smokers, current smokers, and non-current smokers. Um, but of course, we can complicate that with any number of other tobacco use products. And so at some point during uh, some multi-year period, this individual initiates from never smoking to be a current smoker. They uh, discontinue smoking at least briefly and then relapse and become current smokers again. And these happen at, at true real times, um, but we don't observe the times that it actually happens because we're not like texting them every day to be like, you know, were you, you know, smoking today? Um, instead, we only observe what they do at specific observation times, those times of, that we've set for follow-up where we say, okay, in the past 30 days, did you use product X, Y, or Z? Um, and so that's, that's how we think about the data. Um, and then these multi-state transition models um, are one, but not the only approach of, of thinking about how to, to sort of Put, put a framework around, uh, around these data. And what we're gonna do is estimate underlying continuous transition rates. And we can conceive of these transition rates or hazard rates as a kind of pressure or an intensity um, that a person is feeling to transition. And so what that might mean is that, um, that given the uh, data, we might see that there's a relatively low pressure for never smokers to transition to current smokers. It's not zero, uh, it's present, but it's not super high. Um, then the current smoker has some medium intensity to become uh, uh, a non-current smoker, but many of the non-current smokers uh, relapse relatively quickly. So there's like a high uh, transition rate or a high intensity to uh, transition. And so what, we have all this extremely complex data, but we can uh, uh, 
summarize it in a number of sort of parsimonious or small number of parameters. Um, so more uh, technically, multi-state transition models are continuous time stochastic models, and we're tracking tobacco use states through time. It doesn't have to be tobacco use states. This method is really applicable to many, many application areas. But in this context, we're thinking about tobacco use states. As I said, our, the real transitions can occur at any time, but we don't observe them. We only observe the data um, that the state of the person is in at certain times. Um, an important sort of subtlety here is this idea that the transition probability is only going to depend on the state someone is currently in and not on their past states. Um, that's known as the Markov property. Um, we can complicate that a little bit and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, um, but that's sort of the, one of the fundamentals. Um, so why do we care about these transition rates? Why, how are they useful? Um, they're useful because they help us make inferences about sort of what's going on in the larger system of people using tobacco. So for example, we might use them to directly compare transitions between different groups. Um, we'll, we'll call these hazard ratios, the, the hazard rate from one group divided by the hazard rate from another group. Um, and part of that is that the comparisons, the probabilities are challenging to really understand what's going on. So in this example, I'm gonna say that group A is less likely to switch from cigarettes to ends than group B from sort of a straight probability standpoint. But if does, is that just because group A is more likely to discontinue cigarette use altogether um, and because our probabilities have to sum to 100, um, it's affecting all of the other probabilities. So in this example, the um, of the people that are not discontinuing use, still 10% of them are moving from exclusive cigarette to exclusive ends. And is that even the right measure? And so what I sort of want to get the point across here is that like probabilities are actually very challenging to work with and interpret um, because they're sort of pulled in multiple different directions because of these competing potential transitions. Um, once we have these transition rates, we can also start to think about comparing them with to each other. So we could ask whether um, cigarette discontinuation is faster or slower if a person is simultaneously using ends. And so we would compare the transition from exclusive cigarette use to non-current use versus the transition from dual use to exclusive use. Um, and there are sort of many other um, comparisons that we might be interested in making. That's just sort of the, the one that I think is um, uh, uh, foremost in people's minds often. Um, having the rates al also allow us to start thinking about making predictions into the future um, and assessing counterfactuals, that is sort of what if scenarios. So for example, we might ask how many people in group C will still be using both cigarettes and ends in three years? Um, or if menthol cigarettes were no longer an option because um, FDA decides to um, uh, remove them from uh, cigarettes, then um, where are those users gonna transition? Assuming the rates are constant to what they are now. Now that may not be a very good assumption, but at least maybe it's a starting point. So uh, I wanna get a, give a feel for how, how these things sort of start to, to come about. Um, so the, the, the multi-state transition model is trying to take into account these competing possibilities um, and by estimating underlying rates. So here is just a very simple system with um, one with people in a current state and possible future states. And, and the probability that we observe of, of people remaining in that state tells us about the sort of overall magnitude of the pressure or intensity um, felt to transition. And if we look at the probabilities of uh, showing up in other states, then that kind of tells us how to divvy up the remaining um, transition Hazard. So I can, you know, mathematically assign um, the uh, continuous rate corresponding to these probabilities. That's all well and good for this simple example, but um, in our real sort of networks of interest um, or, or, or real um, real situations, um, 
there are sort of many sort of larger in interconnected possibilities for transitions. Um, and this is actually not even nearly as interconnected as some of the ones um, that I work with for tobacco. And so just to, to, just to show that it can be challenging to, to think about all of these competing to possible transitions. So that's all to say um, why we might be interested um, in uh, working with multi-state transition models. And so now I wanna dive a little bit into details to sort of orient you to sort of more specifically, how do you go about developing and interpreting the results of a multi-state transition model? So the first step is to define the states and how you, um, how you are gonna come up with from your questionnaires, the states of interest. Um, and so in this example here on the right, um, I'm gonna take into account both cigarette use and ENDS use and whether an individual is simultaneously a never established, established non-current, established current cigarette user, but also the same for ENDS use. And I'm gonna sort of look at the, the cross tabs there and see, um, define five states a never user of either product, a non-current user of either product, a current established exclusive cigarette user, a current established exclusive ENDS user, and potentially a dual user, a uh, dual current user of both. And so as you develop the states that you're interested in your model, you wanna think about, um, uh, there are a number of things where you can make a decision about something being a state versus something being a covariate. So maybe you're interested in daily versus non-daily cigarette use. Do you want that to be different states that you're gonna be interested in, in people transitioning between those types of use? Or are you interested in that being a covariate that says people who are daily users transition at a higher rate versus those that are non-daily users? And so that's something to start to think about um, as you develop your models. And so that could be similar things like flavors. Um, are flavors going to be um, a something that is a distinct state or something that causes people to transition more or less um, with a greater or less rate? So once you have your states, you have to decide how people can tra transition between them. So the sim simplest thing to do is say that everyone can transition between all the states. Um, there are a couple of reasons not to do that. The first one is that there are probably theoretical reasons that that, that can't happen. So, um, you know, dual users can't then become never users, right? It doesn't work at that directionality. Um, but there are also probably some transitions that don't happen directly very often or hardly at all. Um, and so if you try to estimate that in your model, you're going to run into some sort of computational walls that make it very challenging to sort of efficiently um, uh, compute um, your transition rates. And um, so one thing that I like to do is um, use an information criterion to help me decide whether the number of parameters that I'm putting into my model um, are justified based on how well it fits the data. Um, so I won't go into details in that, but um, I'll have some citations later um, if you're interested in, in, in more details there. And so the general idea here is you want to have as many transitions as both make sense um, theoretically and also, um, but, but not have so many that you're, you're, that you're trying to estimate negligible rates. So once we've defined which transitions are allowed, that, that defines what we call an adjacency matrix. So um, what states are adjacent to each other um, from the perspective of the transitions? Is there an edge that that transition represents? So if I label my states here one through five, then this adjacency matrix has the rows of the from states and the columns of the two states. And if I look across a row, I can see that I have, um, I have zeros along the diagonal. Um, we did, we're not gonna worry about them at the moment. Um, and then I say I have a one or a zero depending on whether or not I'm allowing a, that transition in my model. So um, that green circle represents that state from that, that there is an allowable transition from never to non-current use. Um, that sort of like short-term experimental uh, transition. 
We can transition from one to three, that's initiation of exclusive cigarette use, and from one to four, never to exclusive ends use. In this model, I'm not allowing direct transition from never to dual use. Um, and that again is was based on an uh, information criterion decision. Okay, so I have an adjacency matrix for which transitions are allowed in my model. Um, the way that I, I'm going to uh, eventually connect to data is uh, decide values for the transition rates that go into my now transition matrix. Anywhere there was a one in my adjacency matrix, I have to put a parameter that tells me how fast, how much intensity there is to transition between those. Um, the diagonal here is grayed out because um, by definition um, for this method, the diagonal is given as the negative sum of all of the other columns. So that tells us how likely you are to stay in your current state and all the, the transitions in black are say how, how much pressure there is to transition to other states. Okay. And so here we now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 parameters that are going to define um, sort of collectively um, all of the transitions that I'm allowing in my model. So this Q matrix or transition matrix is gonna allow us to connect uh, directly to the data. And the way that we do that is what, with what's called a matrix exponential. Um, and we won't get into technical details about that, but that the general idea is that you're counting up all of the ways that someone could, could be in one state at one time point and another state at another time point if they did it in one transition, if they bounce between two states, if they bounce between three states, if they bounce between four states, and on and on ad uh, infinitum. And there are um, sort of theoretical ways to calculate that limit as the number of states goes to infinity, the number of transitions. Um, goes to infinity. So the technical details aside, um, there's a way of uh, getting from our transition matrix to this matrix P, which is our modeled transition probabilities cumulative over uh, T time points, usually one we're thinking. And so this modeled transition probabilities directly corresponds to the observed transition probabilities that an individual um, has. So if I take a look at participant five's longitudinal data and I see that they were in state one at one time point and state two at another time point, I go back to my P matrix and say, okay, how likely um, is that, that transition from state one to two? And I assign that value to that person's set of data points. And so I can sort of do this on and on. And that's what we call uh, creating a statistical likelihood. So I'm directly comparing the model to the data. Um, if this is all sort of nonsense to you, um, we can just think that really what's happening here is that I have some function of my rate parameters that gives me a goodness of fit to the data. Um, okay, so moving on to, to other considerations. So um, what covariates do you wanna include in your model? So a covariate is going to um, say that for every level or, or value of your covariate, you actually, um, have to have another value of each of these Q parameters. So if, even if I just wanna look at, for example, men and women, each of them are gonna have 12 parameters. And so you can quickly see that, uh, you can see that, that the number of parameters will quickly um, increase as soon as you start adding covariates, particularly if you wanna think about interactions between different variables. So if you wanna look at age, and sex, then if you have four age categories and two sexes, then you have eight times as many parameters as you originally started with. So that's something to, to keep in mind. But that's not, not to dissuade you, but, um, um, but to sort of be realistic about the computational burden. Um, but they're, depending on what is available in your data, you might be interested in sociodemographics, you might be interested in things like behavior, um, do the, are you gonna distinguish between menthol or non-menthol? Are you gonna distinguish between use frequency, daily, non-daily? Do you have measures about things like dependence or biomarkers that you're interested in incorporating to see if those impact whether people are transitioning um, more or less um, at higher or lower rate? So 
once you've done all this, you have your, your framework together, how are you actually gonna implement this? Um, there's a really great package um, uh, written by Christopher Jackson um, called MSM um, in epidemiology. Um, the MSM has multiple terms. And so this is the multi-state transition model package. Um, and, and that's gonna be sort of good enough for most, uh, most needs. Um, we were interested in working with some weighted data. And so um, we put together this weighted MSM function also implemented in R and it's developed to handle participant weights. Um, so that is available on our T-Cores website. Version 1.0 is available now. I have a version 1.1 hopefully coming uh, shortly. So I think multi-state transition models are great. I think they're very um, versatile. And I think that understanding underlying rates is a, a really great way of understanding what's going on from a systems perspective. But there are some limitations to multi-state transition models. There's that Markov assumption that I mentioned at the beginning. And that is an assumption that the transition rates that we're estimating only depend on individual's current state and not their full history. And you know, particularly in the tobacco control field, you know, we expect full history to matter. We expect the amount of time that you've been in a state to be relevant. So if you are discontinued cigarettes 50 years ago, you're probably more likely to not transition than if you transitioned 50 days ago. And you know, full history, number of quit attempts, um, that sort of thing are probably relevant. And so that doesn't get directly taken into account in our basic multi-state transition model. But there are workarounds. You can incorporate history information as a covariate. Um, I should also say that like when, when talking about multi-state transition models, like this Markov uh, assumption comes up as a limitation uh, pretty often. However, I don't know of any other methods that do a good job of taking into full history. So um, although it is a limitation of this method, I think it's a limitation of basically all the methods that we have for dealing with longitudinal. Um, maybe that they're sort of like machine learning things that we can do to, um, but, but I just sort of want to be realistic about um, what the capabilities of the field are. Another thing is that the rates can change over time. And that, that can complicate things for how, when you estimate and estimate your rates. And so in, in the tobacco control field, you know, there are a lot of marketplace changes, um, particularly in ends, um, things that are changing quite rapidly. And so a uh, question is like, how, how do we deal with that? And so there are, again, ways to work around this. You can incorporate year as a covariate. I found that that gets a little too unstable. So you may want to group it into to groups of years. Um, and you can estimate what I mean by estimating transitions piecemeal. So you do this period of time, you estimate the transitions, and then you follow up the next period of time. OK, so now we've developed our model. We've implemented it. We've got a bunch of numbers out. What do we do with these numbers? Um, and in particular, I find that hazard rates themselves basically are not very interpretable. You know, you're like, okay, the rate was 0.03. You know, it doesn't really even have like good units. Um, it's just a continuous exponential rate. Um, so, you know, how do I then show someone um, what that means? So I think the one great way um, is to convert our transition rates, that Q matrix, into the P matrix, the cumulative transition probabilities. And I like to visualize these as a heat map. So um, if I look across a row, that's gonna tell me the probability of transitioning from that row state to each of the column states. So if I look at never use, 96.6% um, uh, uh, of people that are never users will still be never users after one follow-up visit, 2% will be non-current users because they've experimented and stopped. 1% um, will be exclusive cigarette users and 0.3% will be exclusive ends users. And we can do that for every row. We can see exclusive cigarette users, 85% of them will still be exclusive cigarette users after one follow-up, but 9% of them will be non-current users and so on and so forth. And um, 
these can be adjusted to visualize cumulative transitions over longer periods of time. So if you don't care about one year, um, or maybe your data is in two months and you want to think about one year, well, you can you can do this for longer periods of time. Excuse me. Um, I also like forest plots as a way of visualizing hazard ratios. So if I have a bunch of covariates that I'm interested in understanding how, how they impact the transition rates, I like to use these forest plots um, because if I, you know, I can plot my points with confidence intervals and I can see really quickly what the ones that don't touch one are the ones that are statistically significant. Um, if I have a lot of them, I like to color them so that they, it's very clear to the person looking at it whether it's going to be significant or not. Um, and I'm going to have one of these for every transition because um, in most circumstances, you're going to have your covariates on every transition. There are some things you can do if you like only want your transitions, um, uh, your covariates on certain transitions, but that gets more complicated. So for this example of cig the cigarette to dual, um, we can see that no statistical difference by uh, sex but there are uh, differences by race, ethnicity, and there are differences by age. And so these are well-documented around um, who's an early adopter of ENDS. Okay, so um, as, we, as we wrap up this section of the talk, um, I just sort of wanted to give a couple of, um, of brief um, sort of Places to learn more if you're interested in stochastic processes more briefly, uh, more broadly, um, I recommend Essentials of Stochastic Processes. If you're interested in implementing multi-state transition models, um, Christopher Jackson's um, vignette from his MSM package um, is really great. Um, but if you're interested in what I'm sharing more with this example and the implementation for complex survey design, check out our paper um, published in Tobacco Control in 2020. Okay, so from here, I'm going to give some the I'm going to talk about that paper in a little bit more detail, um, and this is coming from an implementation of a multi-state transition model for the population ass assessment of tobacco health, tobacco and health, or PATH study. Um, and one of the challenges that that sort of came with implementing it for PATH is that PATH has a complex survey design; it has participant weights um, and that um, it can be challenging to implement those, particularly in a computationally efficient way um, without um, doing some behind the scenes work that we've now done and it's available on our, on our website. So um, many of you are probably familiar with the population assessment of tobacco and health study um, or PATH. This is a longitudinal study of tobacco use. Here we're using data from waves one through four, which is roughly 2013 to 2017. And we're including about 23,000 adults from all four waves. As I mentioned, we, this is a complex survey design that includes participant weights and also replicate weights for variance calculation. In this analysis, we included um, covariates of age, sex, race, ethnicity, education, and income. Um, at the time, these are all um, univariable. And I think since then, we've, we've developed um, a, a more efficient way to do multivariable analysis. Our states are derived from past 30-day uh, use of cigarettes and ends and also established use. So um, I'm defining my states to established users. So those pictures I showed you before, those are the states that we used here. So we have our five states of never, non-current, exclusive cigarette, exclusive ends, and dual use. And you know, the first thing to do is check to make sure that your model is actually representing the data in a reasonable way. Um, and so that's what this shows. And you know, we're not going to like hit 100% um, to three decimal points of exact prob uh, transition probabilities. But here on the left, we have the um, empirical or observed transitions averaged over these four waves, um, or really the three transition periods. And on the right, we have the, the multi-state transition model. And as you can see, we do a pretty good job um, of, of matching um, what we actually observe in the data. And so this gives us confidence in the rates that we're estimating and also the hazard ratios. And what we find is that um, cigarette use, um, or, or, you know, and this has been reported 
previously that cigarette use um, was much more persistent in path for this time point uh, than, than uh, ends use was. And so adding up these columns in the row, so exclusive users, if they, be, if they stay exclusive users or they become dual users, they're still using cigarettes. And so 90% of exclusive cigarette users remain cigarette users. And sort of similarly, 72% of exclusive ENDS users are remaining ENDS users. Um, okay. and, and from that, we can project into the future assuming constant rates. So um, on the left, we have two wave cumulative transition probabilities and on the right, four waves, so four years later. And this kind of really highlights the transience of the ENDS use in this time period for this population um, where if we look sort of in the bottom right corner on the right, only 4% of uh, people that are dual users are expected to be dual users four years later. And I wanna emphasize that these results should be considered illustrative, not predictive, because we absolutely expect rates to change um, over time, you know, particularly as Juul um, was starting to uh, increase in prevalence of use sort of towards the end um, of wave uh, four and into waves 4.5 and five. Um, we can compare, like I mentioned earlier, analogous transition rates. So if I look at non-current use to exclusive use and compare that to never, never use to exclusive use, I see that non-current users are five times as like, uh, not, not as likely because that's probability language, but they transition at a rate five times greater than that of never users. And if I look at exclusive ends users, they have a transition hazard of 25 that times never users and approximately five times that of non-current users. So um, I'm not distinguishing whether my exclusive ends users are former cigarette users or not. That might be something of interest for future work, um, but um, we see that ends use is really associated with this a higher um, transition to in starting cigarette use. And I wanna emphasize again that these are not causal statements. These are about associations. So. Um, I have no way of, of uh, determining whether it's the SIGs that are, are causing this, but um, I think that it's sort of a, a useful um, to understand nonetheless. And we can do the same for sort of the cessation or discontinuation rate here. So the dual users um, who are using cigarettes and ends have a transition hazard about twice that to stop cigarettes than those exclusive cigarette users. Um, and so now ends are also associated with this continuation as well as starting again, not causal. I'm not gonna go into like excruciating detail for these sociodemographic, sociodemographic hazard ratios, um, but we get them for all, all of our transitions. Um, I've only shown eight here, the ones that I think are most important. Um, and so we can say, okay, for these two ages, how do they differ in initiation? How do they differ in initiation of ends? How do they differ in um, dual use um, transitions and so on and so forth? Um, I think it can also be useful to say that now if we've broken it into all those competing transitions, let's bring that all back together because, okay, there's a huge hazard ratio on never to ends use, but that's not a very big rate to begin with. It does that really affect things. So it's good to bring it back to these group specific cumulative transition probabilities. So here on the I have um, ages 18 to 24, on the right ages 55 plus, and all of those hazard ratios I calculated now come, in, come into play here. Then I can see that the aged 55 plus are just much less likely to transition. You know, They are continuing with the behaviors that they have, whereas the young adults um, are much more likely to kind of like bounce around between categories. Um, even even non-current users are more likely to um, kind of transition to using again. Um, and so I think that that's a helpful way to, to, to try to understand whether the hazard ratios for any specific transition actually matter in the larger picture. Okay, so just kind of summarizing some of the things that we found, we found that ENDS use was more transient than cigarette use with 90% of exclusive cigarette and 86% of dual users continuing to use cigarettes, whereas only 72% of exclusive end users 
and 51% of dual users continue to use ENDS. Again, this is relatively early on. Um, E-cigarettes and e-products are sort of still developing, not really quite into the dual era yet, um, but it's still sort of helpful to situate us um, as, as a baseline point. We also found that ENDS use was associated with both a greater rate of starting cigarette use and a greater rate of stopping cigarette use. Um, and so I think it's sort of important to understand how that um, you know, matters in the, in the bigger picture. So big picture takeaway, um, hopefully you found this um, uh, seminar useful. Um, hopefully you, you understand multi-state transition models are just, they're one way of approaching uh, analyzing longitudinal tobacco product use. Um, and I think that they have a number of great advantages um, that they allow us to explicitly take into account these multiple competing transitions that if we don't can really kind of muddle up how, how we're seeing things um, in the bigger picture. We can make predictions and assess what if scenarios. Um, we, can, uh, we can start thinking about what will happen you know, if FDA does X versus does Y. Um, and then and, and sort of think about towards the future, say, okay, if ends are going to have this um, impact on these transitions in this way, what, what do we expect to see down the road? Um, and we can also compare similar transitions um, across types of use or sociodemographic groups. And in one way, I think that's very useful. Um, so I just want to acknowledge um, all of my collaborators um, at the Castor T cores at the University of Michigan, um, Georgetown University, Yale University, um, also our federal partners, um, in particular Stephanie and uh, Sandy Land and Eric Fuhr, who um, gave helpful feedback early on in the process, um, and sort of more broadly the, the funding from NCI and the FDA. Um, so thank you everyone, um, and this is probably a good place to stop for questions. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that uh, excellent uh, seminar. So we have a few questions now on the Q&A um, uh, board. Uh, first one is from uh, Heijin Park. Um, how do you, how do you fi finalize your final states? Uh, did you try more states uh, than five? And uh, uh, that's one. So uh, the second question right there is, how did you allow the possible transitions? Uh, did you also made um, an analysis comparing between the allowed transitions? Yep, that's a great question. So um, I, I know that, so my, my personal um, uh, I don't know, like foible is to like start way too complicated and be like, well, I'm interested in all of these different states. I'm interested in like uh, low use, high use. And I think that the, um, uh, I always come back to is that sort of this like KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Um, and so I always come back to uh, start analyzing a relatively simple thing and then complicate it from there. So, um, and that's, that's sort of my answer to the, this first part is how do I finalize my states? I started too complicated, made it simple. And now in future work, I'm going to so, sort of um, explore sort of future breakdowns. Um, in terms of the possible transitions, um, I started with all reasonable transitions and then um, using an information criterion um, tested all sorts of different um, combinations of transitions to see which ones um, had the right balance between uh, parsimoniousness uh, or parsimony and um, fit to the model. And so there's a there are way, sort of statistical ways to balance that. Thank um, you. Yep. So the um, question also from um, Hagen Park is, uh, do you also consider including other tobacco products like cigars, smokeless tobacco also? Um, yeah, so I'm not doing, I haven't done that in my current work, but we do have um, a graduate student in our center that's been working on poly tobacco transitions. And so um, this, is, this, is another, this is another situation where we started simple mm -hmm. and then we started making it more complicated. Um, 
And it does become quite a bit more complicated. And you have, a, you know, you go from 12 states to 40, uh, 12 transitions to like 40 transitions. And then all of those 40 transitions have um, all the covariates on them. And so, like I said, it gets complicated quickly. Thank you. Another question from Juan Pablo Levinger. Can you elaborate on modeling as a state versus covariate? Um, when would you consider one versus the other? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it really comes down to your the aim of your your research question. Um, as as do you do you want to think about? Let's just take an example of like daily versus non daily um, use. Do you want to think about those as distinct categories, and you want to you want to think about how one transitions from non daily use to daily use or daily use to non daily use? Do you want to think about those as separate, or do you just say like I care about the transition from cigarette to non-current, and I'm curious whether that sort of use intensity will impact that. So there, there, there's no like formal way to do one or the other, uh, generally speaking. Um, it kind of comes down to like what you want the results of your model to tell you. Okay. Thank you. Um, a question from Rafael Mesa. Can you incorporate longitudinal covariate data, particularly longitudinal longitudinal biomarker data? Yep. Um, so, so the default I'll say in in these multi-state models is to use sort of the most recent covariate. And so, like sub, something like age, it's really important that you're allowing people to age over time. Um, some of them, you know, for um, like sex or race, ethnicity, probably aren't going to change um, in a person's question, the, the, in their responses to your questionnaire. Um, but some things you, like um, whether they are that a daily or non-daily user, that's something you're definitely going to want to incorporate. And that, that kind of comes um, with the territory of, of the data. So fortunately, that's a relatively easy thing to incorporate. Thank you. Um, a question from Esther Salazar. Uh, in a traditional Markov chain process, it is assumed that the probability of transitioning depends only on the present state and does not depend on past history. Since a person who recently quit smoking may be more likely to relapse than someone who quit many years ago, how does this model can account or be adapted to allow dependence on transition probabilities over time? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and I, I, part of it is going to kind of depend on, on your data. So if you only have um, data like once a year, it can be challenging to incorporate really sort of like short time, um, like they've quit and they're, they're only end up going to quit for 45 days. Like that's, that's kind of hard to take into account. Um, but you can certainly, as a covariate, um, if, if, you're, if your questionnaire is designed to say, how long have you been in your state, you know, however many years, that can absolutely be taken into account. Um, and so um, one, with one of my collaborators, we're looking at um, their data set that has much more fine sort of every two months instead of every, um, every year. And so we're gonna be interested in exploring um, that sort of dependence of time and state as a covariate on transition. So stay tuned for, for that. Thank you. Um, a question from Dana Carl. It seems to get a bit tricky with weights and making sure which weights you use, like all wave weights for wave four means people have to have data in all four wave which can make the modeling transition between two adjacent waves tricky, for example. Lots of people are removed from modeling. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, so that, that is something, you know, particularly as we're working with path data um, that we have thought quite a bit about and sort of gone back and forth. Um, my feeling, so there's there are two things here, right? So you want to maximize the number of people in your observations so that you, you're taking their data into account. But on the other hand, you, you don't want um, differential attrition 
um, to be sort of like secretly weighting your data. And so um, in, in the analysis I showed you here, I did use the all waves longitudinal weights um, to sort of make sure that we're waiting for the people that remained by the end. Um, and at least for this data set that has 23,000 people, I think that it sort of is more than enough. Um, um, but um, but there, there, there could be reasons to, you know, if you're looking at, you wanna look at, I wanna look at these time points. So I am gonna look at the cohort <laughs> weights from waves one to two. And then I'm going to look at the cohort weights from two to three, and there might be like uh, a legitimate reason to do that, for example. So um, definitely, it's a great question and sort of requires thinking for your specific research question. Thank you. Um, uh, one more question from uh, Juan Pablo Levinger. I think we um, addressed something like that before, but uh, is it possible to incorporate continuous covariates? Another great question. So that's something that I'm currently working on. Um, and hopefully in the next, I don't know, couple of months, we'll have uh, planning on having a version um, that we'll, we'll put on our website to at least one continuous covariate um, in transition model. So it's a little bit, you know, coding wise and, and computationally a, a, a bit funny, but that's something that I'm currently working on. Great. Thank you. And uh, one last question from Annette Kaufman. Can you break down your use of the terms transition probability and transition hazard one more time? And why do you, uh, why are you hesitant to use the term causality even with longitudinal data? Could you use causal inference given the complex longitudinal data? Um, yeah, great question. So um, transition probability means um, um, if a person is in one state, what's the probability that they're going to be in each of the other states in one time point, let's say. And so those probabilities have to sum to one. Transition hazard is some positive number that is a, a continuous rate that sort of describes um, the the pressure or intensity to transition to the others. So a larger number means more of a, a transition transition um, intensity. And I can actually compare that transition intensity for two people in different groups that are that have similar uh, that are doing similar transitions. In terms of the, the causality, um, so um, Let's say my background is not particularly in causal methods, and I want to be very careful, you know, particularly around um, questions of like what uh, ends are, are are doing, what they're associated with, um, and and that's partly because, you know, we don't we don't know what an individual would have done had they not been smoking, um, and so that there may be unmeasured things that we're not taking into account. Um, that these associations are taking are, are sort of like abstractly measuring, but that um, I would be hesitant to take into a more causal perspective. That's a, a, a much that's a big question to end on, um, and so we don't really have time to, to dive into a lot of the details there. Um, but definitely, if people have ideas for sort of bringing multi-state transition models into a more causal framework, I mean, I think that that would be a great extension. Terrific. Uh, well, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you very much, uh, uh, all the participants of the webinar. Um, we uh, ran a few minutes after the allotted time, but uh, the, the questions were uh, rather very interesting, and we wanted to uh, just answer them all or have Andrew to have the opportunity to answer them all. Um, but uh, uh, here we are, and uh, it's been a uh, terrific webinar. And to, again, we uh, thank you for your participation, and uh, I hope that you uh, will uh, come back for our next uh, webinar too in a few months. Thank Thanks you for so having much. me. Thank you, Andrew.